Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee.
stronger than mine. It's deeper than old. Somebody tell them, say, I'm glad that it reaches to me. You are my hope, hope like no. Anybody ever needed hope? <laughs> hope like no. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And it reaches. I remember almost a year ago, I was ready. I was ready to drive in the oncoming, oncoming traffic. Like literally, I was like. I was like, man, this ain't even worth it. It ain't, I can't see how, how this is going to get better. I can't, I was so overwhelmed that all I could see was what was in front of me. And I'm literally driving now 95, ready to just take my car and just go into oncoming traffic. But, <laughs> but then hope stepped in my car. Then hope said, you know what, if you just hang on just a little while longer, I promise you that there's something on the other side of this. There's something on, on the other side of this thing. If you could just hold on, if you could just stay strong, anybody need hope, say, say you are my, you are my hope. Say hope like no other. Worshippers to raise that sound. Oh, there's something on the other side of this. There's something on the other side of this. And it reaches. You are my hope. You are my hope. I can face tomorrow because of you, Jesus. I got a future. I got a future. Receive his strength. Receive his love today. You are my strength. You are my strength. Strength like no other. Strength like no other. And it reaches. love of Jesus reaches us at the highest point of our lives and it reaches us at our lowest moment. This is why we celebrate the blood of Jesus because it is precious. It is wonderful. It is wondrous. It is amazing. And because of his amazing love, we decide to come together as a group of believers every Sunday to celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Would you take a moment if you're in your home to stand to your feet with your head bowed. If you're in the room, would you stand with me with your head bowed? We wanna make sure we honor God. We wanna make sure that we celebrate God for this day that he's blessed us with. We wanna celebrate him. 
for his goodness, his graciousness, his greatness towards us, his faithfulness towards us. God is certainly good and he is worthy to be praised. Would you take a moment and begin to think about the goodness of the Lord? If you're in your home, just go ahead and walk the floor of your home. If you're in the room, feel free to roam around and just to think about the goodness of the Lord. If you're on Facebook, take your phone with you, take your tablet with you and begin to walk the room and just celebrate God. It's something about movement. It's something about the receiving of God's grace and mercy. When you start to move, you begin to think about how good he is. Would you begin to think about how faithful he's been to you all week? The doors that he's opened for you, the ways that he's made for you, the opportunities that he's provided for you, the grace and mercy that he has extended to you. Would you begin to think about the goodness of the Lord this morning because he is faithful and he's worthy to be praised. Go ahead and start thinking about the goodness of God. Hallelujah. If you gotta raise your hand, wave your hand, open up your mouth, whatever you gotta do, just begin to thank God for his goodness and his mercy. Begin to thank God for his faithfulness to you. Begin to thank God for how amazing his love actually is. It is like no other. His love is like no other. It is better than any type of love you can receive. Go ahead and begin to thank God. Hallelujah. Begin to thank God. If you're on Zoom or if you're on Facebook Live, go ahead and type in what you're thankful for this morning. We want to celebrate God's goodness and faithfulness. Surely, as you've taken the past few moments to think about the goodness of God, you can, you have thought about what God has done for you. Would you go ahead? and type in something that you are thankful for. God is certainly worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, he is worthy to be praised. The God that we worship is certainly worthy to be praised. Would you go ahead and message in what you are thankful for? God is faithful. He is just, he is kind. He is an amazing God. Go ahead and share with the world. Go ahead and share it with your Facebook family, your online family, what you are thankful for this morning. Hallelujah. 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 God is indeed faithful. Hallelujah. What are you thankful for this morning? Hallelujah. He is worthy to be praised. He is an amazing God. He's a wonderful God. Hallelujah. What are you thankful for this morning? Go ahead and shout it out in the room. Go ahead and text it in on Zoom. Text it in on Facebook Live. What are you thankful for this morning? He is faithful. He's kind. He's just. He's forgiving, he's gracious, he's faithful, he's wonderful. The God we serve is amazing. He's done awesome things for us. What are you thankful for this morning? How has God reached you at your height or at your lowest moment? Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
need to be more outspoken. We need to be more clear about how we think about it. Mm -hmm. It's more than I was just meditating in the world. You know, like it's sometimes we refer to it as a casual, but not a not one that's so intense and changes. Mm -hmm. When people are in the water, the father don't exchange me mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but I'm tired of both just playing the church, mm -hmm. not being in the church the way God He's real. And yes. we have to express that a little bit. Yes. Not, not with the religious God, just be who you watch. Yes. Yes. We need to share ourselves. Yes. Yeah, you can't be private. You can't be real. Is going to go out and say, you can evangelize the whole city? No. But you let your light shine. Yes. 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 I don't know how many heard what Pastor Bruce said. He said that it, we need to express ourselves. And as you were talking, I'm going to read out what people were texting in, what they're thankful for. I don't know if this is Stephanie or Ashley, but Ashley, I think it's Ashley, says she's thankful, thankful for God's love and for him covering family during these times. He's an awesome God and he loves us. Carlton says, I'm grateful for his grace. I can just hear Carlton's deep voice saying it out loud in my ear if he was here. Stephanie says she's thankful, she's thankful to the Lord, even though uh, she's working a lot. Her hours have decreased, actually. God is still providing a roof over her heads. Her kids are in perfect health, and she thanks God for his peace. My wife says she thanks God for breath of life. She says God is faithful, just, and loving. Miss Kaylee says she's thankful for Jesus. Stephanie says she's thankful for peace, and she's thankful that she has the Lord in her life. Caleb says, I'm thankful for finishing my creative projects. Alyssa says, I'm grateful for this day. Stephanie says, God didn't have to restore her mother, but he gave her a heart of praise. He gave her a testimony. She's doing better than she was before her own health crisis. Church, as Pastor Bruce said, we have so much to be thankful for. No matter where you are, no matter where you're watching, this is our moment to celebrate God. If you're home with family and friends, would you tell somebody what you're thankful for? Would you literally walk over to them and tell them, I'm thankful to God for this? We may be social distancing, we may be celebrating God in different places, but we can still tell our family and friends what we're thankful for. If you're on Facebook watching, you can text a friend, you can message a friend. In fact, share this story, this watch party, message them and tell them to watch this particular service. Let them know that God is good to you and you're thankful for this moment of worship. Even in the room, while we're social distancing, shout out to your neighbor across the room what you're thankful for, what God has done for you. He has been doing amazing, amazing things. My wife says she's thankful for her family. Hallelujah. Just go ahead and shout out, talk over each other. There's nothing wrong with that. Stephanie says her relationship with her father, her, her restored as father has been restored. Thank God for that. My wife says she's thankful for the pastor. She's thankful for the church, her brothers and sisters. We have so much to be thankful for. Even in the midst of this pandemic, God has been good. God has been better than good. He's been faithful. He's been amazing. He's been good, good, good to us. And Father, we worship you today. We gladly lift our hands. We don't open up our mouths. Father, we give you glory for all that you've done for us. Father, if there were words to say, the perfect words to say, I'm not sure that we still could find them to articulate how good you've been. Father, you woke us up this morning. You blessed us to see a brand new day. You blessed us, Father, 
to wake up and to experience your grace yet again, in spite of what we, done, we did yesterday, in spite of what we're going through, you allowed us to be here. We thank you for that. There are so many who are experiencing loss, loss in finances, loss of homes, loss of family members, loss of relationships, and yet we are here to celebrate, Father. We thank you for your many blessings. And when we take a moment, Father, to think about our lack of worthiness, when we take a moment to think about the fact that we do not deserve these things, we ought to be more thankful. Father, would you fill our hearts? Would you fill our minds, our soul with your presence? Would you give us more of you? Would you give us more of your presence? Would you speak to us, Father? We've come to receive empowerment today. We've come to receive advancement today, Father. We need you now. Even now, would you move on our behalf, Father, as we celebrate your name? Wherever the church is right now, Father, would you be with us? Would you be with us, Father? Would you send your presence everywhere the church is? And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Let the people of God say amen. Amen, amen and amen. Pastor Bruce, you almost preached my sermon today, man. You might as well preach it today. Uh, while you're standing, we're going to ask that you open your word, your Bible to Matthew 16, verses 24 to 26. If you don't have an app of choice, you can go to livingfaithct.org and scroll down to scriptures for the day. And you'll see the scripture for the day, Matthew 16, chapter 16, verse 24 to 26. As we were talking earlier, and as we were thinking about the goodness of God, uh, you should have been thinking about, in part, your relationship with God. You should have been thinking about your relationship with Jesus. As we get into the middle of the summer and begin to see the summer wind down, I want to continue to encourage you to take a look, a deeper look, a second look, at your relationships, not just the ones you have, the human ones, but I want you to take a look at your relationship with Jesus. Again, we coming out of Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 through 26. Here was what the word of the Lord says. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 25, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. 26, for what will it profit a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, if he gains the whole world and forfeits or loses his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? As you, as you take your seats, we're going to be talking about I'm in a relationship with Jesus. I am in a relationship with Jesus. Uh, the journey to following Jesus uh, is an interesting one. Uh, it is interesting because uh, following Jesus pauses us, forces us, challenges us to tap into the spiritual element of our existence. As you were thinking about the goodness of the Lord, some are quiet, some are expressive, some uh, like to think deeply, some like to articulate out loud what God is doing in their lives. But however you express yourself, notice that the thoughts of what God has done for you, in fact, is indeed a spiritual experience. The spiritual side of you is equally alive to the human side of you. And when you are following Jesus, he causes you to tap into your spiritual self. This is an experience 
like none other. Now, I can go down the road and teach on and preach on the examples of Jesus when he healed the sick, raised the dead, because those things are literally examples of what it means to experience the miraculous power of God. But when you really explore those experiences, when he helped the woman with the issue of blood, when he forgave the sins of the harlot or the adulterers, when he healed the man who was sick for 38 years, while physically we relate to that because we felt sickness, we felt guilt, we felt shame, we felt all that stuff, really those experiences are spiritual ones because it requires one to believe that God can do more than anything in my life. So following Jesus is indeed a spiritual experience. Following Jesus results in a development of spiritual skills that we thought we could never develop. Spiritual skills like loving our neighbors, spiritual skills like forgiving our enemies, spiritual skills like embracing challenges on our journey. Jesus, as our chief apostle, teaches us what it means and how to love people, even when they are uh, mad at us or they're jealous of us or they're envious of us or when they're trying to harm us, he teaches us how to love our neighbor, to forgive our enemy, even when they're trying to kill you and put you on a cross. He teaches you how to forgive and how to embrace the ups and the downs. Jesus taught his disciples that, listen, I am the chief apostle and I have no home. I have no promise of food. I can't give you a mansion, can't give you a million dollars, but here's what I can give you, a spiritual experience, the challenge of following God. He taught us how to do that. Following Jesus also challenges us to think differently and to live differently and to be different. As you said in your testimony, uh, when you experience Jesus, things just change. There's a metamorphosis that you go through. You are no longer the same. You may look the same. Uh, but you feel different, you, you move different, you act different. This is the power of Jesus. Many people come into contact, G, in contact with Jesus in different and unique ways. How we meet Jesus may be different from our neighbor. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he called some who were business people. They were small business owners. He called some who were physicians, some who were lawyers, some who were tax collectors, some who were just regular Joe Schmoes. This is indicative of what Jesus does. He does not segregate who he's going to call. He's going to call black and white. He's gonna call brown and green. He's gonna call the short and the tall, the fat and the skinny, the male and the female. He's gonna call everything in between unto him. The responsibility, as we will talk about later, is for you in your current state to heed the call of Jesus because you want to be in relationship with him. Even with his disciples, Jesus called them in different places and spaces. Some were on a boat, some were behind a tax collecting booth, some were under a tree, some were just chilling with family. God will call you whenever and wherever because there is something he wants you to experience. He wants you to experience a relationship with him. When you reflect on how you connected with Jesus, when you reflect on how you connected with Jesus, how you connected with Jesus, you notice a couple of things. You notice that your relationship with Jesus is just different. See, see, before you got saved, you may not have recognized the power and the presence of Jesus but once Jesus comes into your life, you'll recognize things in a totally different way. You, you'll notice that if it wasn't for him on my side, I'm just not sure if I would have made it through this circumstance. If it wasn't for his grace, if it wasn't for his forgiveness, if it wasn't for his mercy, I'm just not confident that I would have made it to the other side. Now, he might have covered me unexpectedly in previous situations before I got saved. But now that I'm saved, I'm much more conscious of his presence. The car accident that could have but did not happen because of his presence. I didn't have any money, but all of a sudden I have what I need because of his presence. I used to be scared of doctor reports and now I'm more faithful than ever because of his presence. 
He's a provider. He's made things different for me. And in fact, my relationships with other people are different. How I interact with people, how I talk to people, how I, how I look at people, they're just different. But here's something else that's different too. When you come into a relationship with Jesus, you realize you bring things into the relationship too. You bring things into the relationship with Jesus. Have you noticed that when you connected with Jesus, that your daily walk is different? Have you noticed since you've been in Christ that your talk is different? Have people told you that since you've been saved, your countenance, how you look, how you present yourself is different? If you've answered yes to those questions, then it stands to reason that Jesus is the difference maker in your life. I mean, you used to get stressed out and you used to be on 100. Now you just at about a 50. That's progress. <laughs> well, you used to be a wreck. And now you are wreck sometimes. That, that's progress. It's because of Jesus. It's because of his presence in your life. You deal with things different because of Jesus. You, you deal with life different because of Jesus. It's not because you got it all together. If that was the case, we don't need Jesus. But because of Jesus, I just see the world different. I see my life different. Now, I said earlier, we come into the relationship with Jesus with stuff. For those of you who are watching, who are listening, if you think that you have to have everything together before you come to Jesus, that is a false narrative. Jesus said that, come unto me, all of you who are laden and heavy burdened. He is indicating that I want you to come into the relationship with your stuff. He wants you to come into the relationship with him with your baggage. He's not looking for you to get all your stuff together before you say, I want Jesus. No, you can just come as you are right now, gay or straight, black or white, racist or not, Thief, robber, murderer, come as you are right now with all of your burdens. If you're heavy laden, come unto me. Jesus says, I will give you rest. I will change your situation for you because I can handle it. When everybody else is struggling to understand you and who you are and what you're about, Jesus says, Come unto me and I will manage all of this for you. I will make a transition for you. I will exchange the struggle you have for peace. Amen. I'll exchange the struggle you have for joy. This is why this is a high impact spiritual experience when you come into relationship with Jesus because you've tried to quit your habit all by yourself and you realize, I can't do it. Hey, you, you try to change your behavior all by yourself, and you come to the conclusion, I can't make a change by myself. But what Jesus is saying, come unto me with all your addictions, all your idiosyncrasies, all your weird preferences, and all the things you like to do, and I'll exchange it. I will give you rest. I'll ease your mind. I'll ease the anxiety. I'll ease the stress. Being in a relationship with Jesus changes things. But we have a question that we got to answer today. And that question is, uh, what type of cross do you need to pick up when you follow Jesus? This brings us to our text today in Matthew 16, 24 to 26. When we claim that we are in a relationship with Jesus, there are a couple of things we need to acknowledge about our relationship with Jesus. Why do we need to acknowledge these things I'm about to share with you? Number one, because as we experience life and as life is changing for us and as our life is shifting, there are going to be people who are going to have questions about how we changed our life. The world does not understand spiritual transformation. 
be conformed, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. The world does not understand mental, spiritual shifts. And when people start to experience you differently than how they've experienced you in years past, they're going to have questions. This is no different when you go on a major weight loss transformation. The question, the first thing out of people's mouth is how? I mean, they might say congratulations, but the first question is like, dude, how? Like, how did you do that? Because I still saw you eat them cheesesteaks every day. I still saw you eat those word ice cups every day. How did you, how did you change your life? How did you look different? What about when a woman falls in love and she's glowing, as they say? And the question is, how? What's different about you? It's not congratulations if you found something different. The question is, what's new? Like, like what changed? And people got questions. The Bible teaches us that we ought to have an answer of hope when people question us about the hope that exists within us. When our life changed, we have a new outlook. You ever notice that when you pay your bills off and your bills are at zero, you got all this new hope, this newfound hope and belief about the future and what could be and what might be? Y'all ever had that experience when your bills are at zero and you owe nobody but love and you feel all this expectation inside? You ever had that feeling that when you finally lose the weight you're trying to get off that you feel like you can live longer, jump higher, run faster? You ever had that feeling that when you've accomplished a goal that the future is bright? When you achieve one thing, you think you can achieve all things. This is what the Bible is telling us, that when you have the hope and people want to question the hope inside of you, you got to have a clear answer. So when we talk about today being in a relationship with Jesus, people are going to want to know what's different and why should I be a Christian? Notice what Jesus is teaching us in Matthew 16, 24. He says, then he told his disciples, if any of you come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Notice a couple of things. Coming after Jesus is up to us. Before we go any deeper in this sermon, coming after Jesus is up to us. We must choose to go after Jesus. Notice the clause in the text in verse 24. If you decide to come after me, if you decide to hear the call, if you decide to be responsive to the love and the grace and the opportunity I provided to you, you have an opportunity to come after me and be in my inner circle. God will not chase after you to make you love him. God will not chase after you to make sure you acknowledge the goodness that he's provided in your life. Whether we willfully or ignorantly decide not to acknowledge God, God is and always will be good. He is and always will be great. He is and always will be amazing, whether we acknowledge it or not. Is God any less good when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit and disobeyed him? No, he, he was great before. He was great during that time. And he's still great. And even if you don't tell a soul about God, God is still faithful. It helps that you acknowledge the goodness of the, the goodness of the Lord. It helps that you tell your neighbor that God is good. It helps that you text somebody to join the sermon today, the service today, and tell them how good God is, and you need to watch the service. But God without us is still good. The word says that if you don't cry aloud, the rocks will cry out. Nature will be responsive to my goodness and faithfulness with or without you. The relationship you want to have with Jesus, the one you do have, is based upon the clause of if. If anyone will come after me, coming after Jesus is simply what he said. It means to come after him. Jesus, he did the hard work 2,000 years ago. He came on the scene. He experienced what it means to be you and I. He experienced temptation at every level and ultimately gave his life, died on the cross, for the sins we were yet to commit. He did the hard work. Now, when you're going to go after Jesus, if you're watching this broadcast and you want to come in relationship with Jesus, it starts with the if clause. If you choose to come after me, you got to choose to come after him. But then next coming after him requires you to do just that. Come after him. Follow him. Walk in his footsteps. Take the, take the journey that he's been through. This is not a challenge to see how high you can jump. This is a challenge of faith. 
when you are in relationship with Jesus, this Zoom, this Facebook is a challenge of faith. A challenge of whether you're going to believe that God can change and elevate your life. A, a challenge of faith to believe that God can shift things in your life, that he can give you peace and hope and joy beyond your wildest imagination. This is a challenge of whether you're going to be responsive to that still small voice that's been calling your name all these years. He says, if you're going to come after me, simply come. The pursuit of greatness and greater success requires you to do what Jesus is teaching. He says, if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself. If you want to be successful, there are three keys Jesus provides in the depth of this lesson, which is not really the topic, but it's worth talking about. If you want to achieve the next level, the next phase of your life, Jesus give you, gives you the three secrets. Deny yourself, discipline your feelings, discipline your desires, discipline your perspective. If you want change in your life, deny yourself. Now, some will read this and say, I don't have to deny myself. I want to be myself. I want to feel all of everything I feel. That's cool and that's great. The question you got to ask yourself is, how far has that gotten you so far? Responding to every impulse has gotten you absolutely nowhere. The irony of people today in the world that say, I want to be me with no inhibitions, that does not account for the areas in their life when they actually show discipline. I can say amen to my own self. When people want to sin and do whatever they want to do, there are areas in their life where they actually deny themselves. A sinner can lose weight too. A sinner can go back to college and get a degree too. A sinner can build a business too. A sinner can build a family too. It takes sacrifice. All of us that have done those things, gotten a job, gotten a career, gotten a, a, a degree, started a business, started a family, it requires discipline. Whether you're a sinner or not. So if you know how to discipline yourself in the middle of your sin, you know how to deny yourself. Stop crying. You just don't want to do it. Call it what it is. I don't want to follow Jesus. It's that simple. Don't act like denying yourself is bad information. Stop it. You lie. Stop. Following Jesus is a spiritual transformation that we choose to go through. But Jesus said you want to be successful. Deny yourself. Number two, step two, take up your cross. Really interesting here because oftentimes we associate taking up the cross with death, with extreme suffering. Let me just provide additional perspective to that. It does not mean that perspective is wrong, but let me just share this with you. The cross represents passion. Even when he was being rejected by the folks, the creatures that he came to save, his passion would not let him quit. Even when he healed the people that he came to heal and they still denied him, his passion would not let him stop. Even when they denied him publicly and would, I, would not acknowledge who he was, knowing that he was a son of God, his passion would not allow him to give up on them. The cross is a symbol of passion. And when you have passion, it causes you to struggle and suffer until your passion becomes a reality for you and other people. Yes, His passion caused him to die on the cross. He taught a lesson that when the seed dies, it allows for the seed to be buried and to sprout out other seeds, other results. When you have passion, you are not scared to struggle, suffer, or die. An entrepreneur that has passion for their business will not be scared of everything that is coming and will come. You're not scared to manage people. You're not scared to take in revenue. You're not scared to spend money. You're not scared to sell and market your product. And you're not scared to go up against competition because my passion for my business and my product will push me over the edge until I find success. 
The passion of a good parent, need to distinguish that, causes them to suffer for their children, to deny anything that will stand in the way of their children being whole and safe. And anything that gets in the way of me making sure of my kids' safety and security will be removed because my passion for my children must be realized. This is why a good father provides, he puts a fruit over the head, he puts food on the table, puts clothes on the back. This is why a good mother nurtures and teaches and God, what I'm teaching, what I'm saying today is all Bible. This is not gender issues in our social construct of today. The Bible instructs the man to provide and to govern the house just as Christ covers him. And it instructs the woman to nurture and guide the children of the house. A good mother and a good father realizes their passion. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. They realize their passion must be realized in order for the child to be successful. And all of us in this room ought to be thankful for the good parents in our house. If you have a passion for a community interest, a passion for a social justice issue, you will not quit because of being denied by politics and legislation. You will not be denied because the masses are not on your side. You are more encouraged until you influence other people to recognize the importance of the issue that you are fighting for. Passion causes you to move forward. The cross represents passion. Jesus is giving you insight when you want to be successful. Step one, deny yourself. Step two, take up your cross. Take up your passion. And Jesus gave you the last step of success. Follow me. You want to learn how to deploy your passion for success? You want to learn how to deploy your passion to impact and change the world around you? You want to realize how passion can cause people to experience life different? Follow me. If you have any passion areas in your life, follow Jesus with that passion. If you want to see something different in your life, Jesus says, take up your cross and bring it with you as you follow me. See, the misconsumption, the misunderstanding, rather, of what it takes to follow Jesus is that you deny all of who you are and what you love. That, that is not true. Jesus told the rich man, if you want to follow me, sell all your goods and give it to the poor. And the rich man, according to the scripture text, was sad because he loved his passion, he loved his money way, way, way too much. What always perplexed me when I studied that particular text was if you knew how to get money, if you knew how to build a business, if you knew how to get a job, you can sell and lose everything and get it right back. Man, nobody's saying nothing to me up in here. If you know how to manifest your passion, giving away any results you have today means absolutely nothing because you know how to get it right back and then some. Jesus taught, thank you, Maria. <laughs> Jesus taught lesson upon lesson about the importance of knowing how to gain skill, knowing how to gain resources, knowing how to leverage resources because if you're really good at your craft, if you're really good at your passion, you know how to let that thing manifest in your life over and over and over and over again. My goodness. Everything that has gone wrong in your life was not meant to hurt you. It feels that way. But what some people were designed to be evil, God meant it for good. To build your faith. My wife and I in 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, we went through terrible financial distress because of the market. We lost our businesses. We started a young family. We were struggling. And I remember going through that and feeling absolutely lost. And then I realized I'm more than what I lost. 
the relationship I had with Jesus, and I, this is my true story, meant more to me than everything I lost. My relationship with Jesus meant more to me than everything that I held uh, high and high regard. It meant more to me, his relationship with me, his love for me, his forgiveness of me was more valuable than everything that I lost in 2008. And then he taught me how to regain what I lost and then some. Your passions must come with you when you decide to be in relationship with Jesus. So when we analyze all of this, when you say I'm in a relationship with Jesus, there are four things I'm gonna leave with you. You have to decide to be in a relationship with Jesus. The opportunity is here. It's always here. If you're watching and you're watching on Facebook or Zoom and you're not a believer, just texting, I want to be in a relationship with Jesus. We'll take you in and we'll connect you to Jesus. We'll take connect you to the kingdom. But you have to decide to want to be in relationship with him. You want him to teach you. You got to decide to be in a relationship with him. He is the master teacher. He is the chief apostle. He is the word, the beginning and the end. He is wisdom that was with God when the heavens and the earth were created. You want to learn how to live life. You want to learn how to live your best life. You really want to go from the bottom and now we're here. Follow Jesus. Step two, you have to discipline yourself. Control areas of your life that are out of control. You can do it through the help of the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No matter the area of non-discipline, tap into the Holy Ghost, tap into the spirituality connected with Christianity, and you will find you bringing yourself under subjection. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the... Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the... Come on, text it in Zoom, Facebook. Y'all y'all see my hand motions. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, of your mind that you may prove the perfect and acceptable will of God. Yes, Discipline yourself. Control yourself. Shame the enemy for even trying to tempt you. Step three, you have to bring with you a passion that defines you. Everyone's passion is different. What fuels me is different from what fuels you. I'm in conversations with people all the time and I talk about certain things over and over and over again. I was talking to my cousin yesterday uh, and a couple of friends and, and I had made a comment and then he said to me, why do you care about that so much? And I, and I know the answer and I said, well, no, man, it's just something that just always that bothers me. And then he responded, I don't care about that. See, my passion causes me to bring up the same topic every time we have a conversation that looks like this. And <laughs> my passion. And my passion doesn't look the same as it does for my cousins or my friends. Your passions and what fuels you, fuels you in this life is unique. The beautiful thing about that, this makes the kingdom of God diverse. This is what makes the kingdom of God powerful. When there are disciples of Jesus with various passions influencing politics, business, family, communities, work, whatever it is, sports, whatever it is, we need more believers following Jesus and taking up their cross, i.e. their passion. Whew. Yes, sir. And then lastly, you got to follow the teachings of Jesus to impact and change the world around you. You are here to create and initiate change. You are here to be different and unique, to be special, and to be everything that you are to create change. Things should change because of you. As I close this sermon, I want to just briefly highlight the rest of this teaching in verse 25. 
about being in a relationship with Jesus. It's going to grow you spiritually. Listen to what he says in verse 25. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. If you cannot let go of what you consider important so that you can follow Jesus, you in fact lose your life. What does that mean? Your ability to let go allows you to grow. It allows you to receive. I remember a conversation I heard about two years ago between Magic Johnson and Maverick Carter, who's the manager, uh, business partner of LeBron James. And Magic Johnson made a comment uh, when he talked about really uh, going from wealthy to exponential wealth. And he said he realized something that made a difference in his business. He said that I used to spend a lot of energy uh, prepping for and engaging in million dollar meetings, million dollar meetings. And then one day he realized that the same energy and time he put into million dollar meetings is the same energy and time he would put into multi-million dollar, billion dollar meetings. And so he let go of the meetings that weren't meeting the financial threshold and put the energy, the same energy he was giving to the lower level of financial meetings to higher level meetings, more lucrative meetings, same energy, same time, same effort, just more zeros. When you let go of what you consider ultra important, you allow Jesus to exchange the low level stuff for higher level stuff. Amen. More spiritual growth, more natural growth, more financial growth, more relationship growth. When you let go of the little things that really don't mean anything in the grand scheme of things and open up your hand to receive Jesus with the same size a palm you got will give you something more valuable. Your palm is capable of holding a dollar bill. It's also capable of holding a five dollar bill, a 10, 20, or a hundred dollar bill. In fact, your palm is big enough to hold a penny. The size of your palm will never change, but what's in your hand can change. Are you willing to let go of that penny, that nickel, that dime, that quarter, that half dollar, if you even know what that is, <laughs> to open up your hand and allow Jesus to exchange it for something more valuable? Are you willing to grow enough spiritually to let go of what you learned earlier in the faith to grow even more in the faith today. He says, when you try to save your life, attain it, you lose more. Verse 26, last verse. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Being selfish and trying to meet all your goals for yourself to be the most holiest person for yourself, to be the richest person for yourself, to do all things for yourself is nothing but temporary gain. Along the way, because you're so selfish, you lose relationships that could have enhanced your life. What does it mean to gain the whole world and lose your soul and have no one to take care of it? What does it mean to build wealth, to build a house, to build a home and have no family to enjoy it with? What does it mean to live your life 70, 80, 90 years if the Lord wills it and have nowhere to go when his life is over? There is a place to go when this life is over. Over, It's called heaven. What good is it to gain everything you wanted in this earth and realize at the end of your time here, there's nowhere to go but down. There's more to life than what you see, both now and then, for a time to come. What are you going to give exchange for your soul? It's not worth it. At the end of the day, the focus is on verse 24. I'm in a relationship with Jesus. I'm in a relationship with Jesus. That's what matters. That's my agenda. That's what I'm about. That's what my life is about. I'm in a relationship with Jesus. If you're listening to this call and you're listening on Zoom or Facebook and you're not in a relationship with Jesus, but you want to be, would you just text in, I want to be in a relationship with Jesus? 
Would you be humble enough to realize that I need more than what I got right now? Just say, I want to be in a relationship with Jesus because he's waiting for you, but you have to come after him. The simply message, I want to be in a relationship with Jesus. If you're watching on Zoom or Facebook and you're already in a relationship with Jesus, but you heard this message and realize, I want more of Jesus, just go ahead and message that in. I want more of him. I need to take my relationship with Jesus to the next level. If that's you in a room, just say it out loud. I want more of Jesus. I want to go deeper. I want to go higher. I want to go wider. I want more of a dynamic relationship with Jesus. If you already have a relationship with him, just type in, I want more. I want more. I want more. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is so powerful. It, it changes lives, literally changes lives. And we thank you for the power of your word. We thank you for what your word has done and continues to do. Father, as you see these messages coming in, flying in, saying, I want more of you. For those that are going to watch this broadcast later and say, I want to be in a relationship with you, Jesus. Father, would you respond? Would you respond to the requests? Father, would you respond? For those that want you for the first time, would you... <laughs> would you send your presence right now in the name of Jesus? No matter when this broadcast is replayed or rewatched or shared, Father, would you send your presence right now? Would you allow that person to feel the comfort of what it means to come unto you and to unburden themselves? Would you send your presence now to let them feel the rush of what love feels like, what relationship feels like in the name of Jesus? And if you're listening to this prayer, would you welcome God's presence into your space right now, into your home, into your car? Would you open up your heart and your soul and your mind and just tell God, welcome? Hallelujah. For those that are saying now and who are going to say it later, I want more of Jesus. Father, would you expand us? Sometimes, Father, when you expand us, it's not easy. It can be the most horrific experience. It can be challenging. But, Father, we, we want more. We want to be more spiritual. We want to be more faithful. We want to be more loving. We want to be more thoughtful. We want to be more considerate. Father, would you give us more of you? Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Father, we want to proudly say that we are in a relationship with you. We want to be proud about the relationship we have with you, Father. We, we want to let everyone know because of you, we are here. And as we acknowledge our relationship with you, Father, we welcome what Jesus said he'll do for us, that, that he'll acknowledge us when it's time to advocate for us at the throne. We acknowledge our relationship with Jesus. As we depart from this place, Father, but not from your presence, would you be with us? Would you keep us? Would you watch over us? Would you guide us? Would you lead us? Would you protect us? And as you're doing those things, Father, would you open up our eyes and our awareness of your presence in our life. We love you, Lord. We rely upon you. We need you. We desire you. And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Let the people of God say amen, amen, and amen. We pray that you are blessed by the word today. And as you are preparing to, uh, to leave this place, we invite you to initiate your giving. Uh, you can go to livingfaithct.org. It's right over my head, Living Faith ct.org you can scroll down and you can initiate your giving through cash app and if you want to do it through a debit or credit card you can initiate your giving through tithely just simply click on the link that suits your ability of what you would try what you're trying to initiate again go to live in faith ct.org you can initiate your giving 
there. We are a tithing church. We believe in tithing. We believe in the word of God when it says that when you tithe, the Lord will open up a window of heaven and pour out blessings that you cannot contain. We have seen God do miraculous things because of our faithful giving. And I invite you to tithe into this ministry. If you have offering a love gift here, you can leave it in the back of the room. And if you want to mail it in, you can mail it to Live in Faith Church, care of Dr. William Clark. The address is 75 Charter Oak Avenue. Again, that's 75 Charter Oak Avenue. That is Suite 1-301. 1-301 Hartford, Connecticut 06106. Again, that's 06106. And for those of you initiating your giving through Cash App and through Tithely from through Living Faith CT.org, we want to thank you for your faithful giving. We appreciate you. We appreciate your investment. While you are giving, I also want to shout out and acknowledge uh, Pastor Bruce, uh, Lisa, uh, Art, my wife, and my children last week. Uh, after church, uh, we were we stuffed uh, a number of masks. I think about 95 masks inside of brown bags. Uh, we put a label on there, welcoming people to our church, and also we wrote messages of love, hope, and faith on the envelope um, container. And then around Tuesday, Stephanie and her children came to pick up that package, and they distributed all 95 masks, and we were able to bless uh, the homeless in our community. I want to thank you all for your support and your efforts there, for those that gave toward the effort, for those who are giving. This is why your offerings and your tithing matters. We want to do more. There is so much more to come. But I want to thank you all for supporting that effort. I want to thank Stephanie and her children uh, for leading that effort. And we want to thank God for those who have given to the church. Amen and amen. Before we wrap today, and as folks are still giving, any special prayer requests? Yes, ma'am. All right, we'll pray for Art Jr. We'll do. Yeah, well, we'll pray for Senior too, and and the third. <laughs> pray for all three. <laughs> Any other prayer requests? If you have prayer requests on Facebook or Zoom, type it in. Anyone else in the room? Any other prayer requests? Mm -hmm. We'll pray for him. We'll do. Anyone else? Go on once. You want to type in your prayer request? Anyone else? Everyone else is good? All right. Praise the Lord. Thank you, man. Appreciate that. Lord, we thank you for uh, this time that we have to worship. We want to thank you, Lord, first off, for the gifts that have been given. We appreciate every gift from the smallest to the largest. We thank you, Lord, for the faithful giving of the membership of this church and those who are not members but just feel compelled to tithe and invest in this ministry. We want to thank you, Lord. We pray that you return to give 30, 60, 100 fold. Father, we also pray blessings upon Art Jr., Sr., and the third. We pray you continue to heal Art Sr. as he recovers. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in his life. We pray, Father, that you heal Art Jr.'s body and the difficult physical, physical things he's going through. Father, would you open up a door for his healing? Would you open up a door for another job, another opportunity, so he can continue to provide for his family, Father? We also pray for Maria's brother who is experiencing physical pain in his knee. Father, we pray healing right now in the name of Jesus, wherever that man is. Would you send healing? Would you send your power right now in the name of Jesus? And for those who have prayer requests that go unmentioned or go untexted, Father, would you respond to their needs in the name of Jesus? We pray this prayer because, Father, our prayer of faith signifies our trust in you. And we're going to walk in faith. We're going to live in faith. We're going to act in faith. In the name of Jesus, let the people of God say amen and amen. We'll see you guys next Sunday. God bless you.